Let's not let, I mean, let us, You're the only one not being honest, Omar. You're if, not if being honest. Find, find, the, clip. find the clip. You don't have to argue about the it. You don't have to argue about it. Find the clip. You just admitted to it. We don't need it. This is second against black men. First of all, I want to see where you all stand. Just by a yes or no. Dr. Umar, is there? Yes or no? Absolutely, yes. Hope, is there? No. Duan? Absolutely, yes. Cynthia G, where are you on this? The only war is the war that Black men are waging against the Black community. So is that a yes or no? Yes, <laughs> there is. Well, there's a couple things. Number one, we have to make sure that we conduct a systems analysis and an institutional assessment. Communities are made up of institutions or the lack thereof. Communities are governed by systems or the lack thereof. Let us be very clear about something. This fratricide, this black on black crime that so many of our brothers are engaging in. Let us remember, Irish did the same thing. Italians did the same thing. European Jews did the same thing. And in the 1930s and 1940s, the United States government decided to upgrade them to white status and in so doing gave the Italians control of the fire departments in the black community, gave the Irish control of the police departments in the black community and gave the European Jewish immigrants control of the civil service municipal jobs that they still control in many city centers today. The point that I'm making, Tammy, is that America gave Southern European immigrants an economic stimulus package. Before they gave that economic stimulus package to Jews, Irish and Italians, they were doing the exact same thing black men are doing today, selling drugs, breaking the law, running in gangs, killing one another. But the government intervened and aided them. The reason black male pathology is still going on 30, 40, 50 years later is there has been no resolution, there have been no solutions, and there have been no governmental intervention. With that being said, I'm not waiting on the government to solve the problems of black men. We as black men have to unite, come together, organize, and solve our own problems. Just because we can admit that the government introduced pathology into the black community, we can still take full responsibility for ending it ourselves. Hope, I see you nodding. Yes, because I feel like when you can name all of these things so eloquently and so beautifully, and yet y'all still fail at being able to do these things after years and years and years and years and years of trying, where do we find a new solution? War that, is, that we're fighting for Black men is the one that Black men are fighting within themselves. Is it about adjacency to whiteness? Is it about being able to assimilate to that white hand? Or is it really about the freedom of Black men in the Black family and the Black community? They want to assimilate to whatever whiteness, whatever white male privilege they, that they can get. And that's a large part of the problem. Dr. Umar, you welcomed us to the show by saying black power, black power. OK, um, is is there some truth to the assimilation that black men want or perceive to want when it comes to this war being waged against well, you? Well, there's definitely some truth to it. But I think that truth is also evident in black women. Uh, black men, many of them may choose to want a white woman, but many black women choose to look like white women. So we have to look at ourselves and we have to recognize that the pathology is not more of one gender than the other. That's the issue I have with conversations that seek to see who is more at fault, the black man or the black woman. It's not about who's more at fault. We rise together or we will perish together. The black man cannot survive without his woman and the black woman cannot survive without her man. And the issue that I take with my two sisters narrative is I hear a lot of criticism. I hear a lot of condemnation, but I don't hear any empowerment. I don't hear any solutions coming from either one of them. It appears as if that there is a hatred towards black men about those sisters. Even when they said, why are we going back to 1960? Let's stay in 2022. That is so immature and irresponsible of a statement. As a psychologist, when a client comes into my office, the first thing I perform is a history on their depression, a history on their suicide, a history on their anxiety. When you go see the medical doctor, he performs a history. When you go buy a home, they perform a history. When you go purchase an automobile, they perform a history on that automobile. But when we talk about the problems that affect black males, we're supposed to look at it in a vacuum. We're not supposed to put it in a historical context. And with that being said, the, the language and the narrative that's coming out of the mouth of these two black women is one that I think the white power structure would endorse because it totally absolves them of any responsibility for the hell black men catch in this country. 
Cynthia G, you did say, why are we going all the way back to 1960? <laughs> there is some truth to history when it comes to evaluating anything or anyone. So what do you say to that? I say we should go to the historical context because what I have not heard from Dr. Umar Johnson, or I think his name is um, Dwayne. Dwan. Dwan is what I have not heard as they're mentioning all of the things that was done to them. I haven't heard what you did in response to it. So I would like to know, what did you do in response in, the his in history other than go to the Supreme Court and petition to have access to the men's women that you're complaining and, and accusing of disenfranchising you? See, because in the 1960s, what Black men were really doing and that and it's been documented many civil rights leaders have admitted to it what black men were doing is chasing the white man's woman trying to so-called stick it to him by way of going to their women what you should have been doing is trying to get liberation for yourself you, what you should have been trying to do is get that foot off your neck but see the foot is not on your neck and the only time you recognize it being on your neck is when you want to get away with doing something that you think white men are getting away with doing. Because let's just be real. Whenever we hear about this war against black men, it's usually being brought up when there's a black man like R. Kelly, Bill Cosby. We see Trey Songs going through it, Ari Spears, when they engage in some degeneracy and then they're getting a consequence for it. And black men think that because they perceive white men to be getting away with crime, they want to be able to get away with crimes as well. The reality is Umar, Dr. Umar can sit up here and list all the different ways that the system is disenfranchising black men and lump black men in a victim vote. But the reality is he can, what he cannot tell you is what black men did in response to it because they did nothing. They laid down and they nested under the skirt of their non-black preferences and only to complain that Whenever they commit a crime, they're not getting off like they so did. Let's mentioned. find out. Dr. Umar, what have black men done? Well, number one, again, I think that it is such a shame coming from a psychological perspective that we seek to heal our wounds as a people by relying on unprofessional testimony by individuals who have a vendetta against the opposite gender in their community. When you hear Sister Cynthia speak, you can hear a hurt and a pain and a hatred towards black men. We cannot find an effective solution to black male female relationship issues or the oppression of black men or black women when the people at the table having the conversation have uh, emotional, negative, emotional and pathological interest in the conversation that are not- Umar, the question wasn't about my emotional state. The question now, was, what did black men do in response to I their disenfranchisement? Talking, I was talking, I was yeah, talking, because, because talking. you're trying to pathologize my emotional state, May not that I'm a psychologist too, but what May you're I not finish? doing is telling us what black men did. I, I believe he'll get there, Dr. May Omar. finish? Dr. Omar? And I'll end it quickly, Sister Tammy. According to Mrs. Cynthia G, Dr. King was assassinated because he was doing nothing. Malcolm X was assassinated because he was doing nothing. Mega Evers was assassinated because he was doing nothing. Fred Hampton was assassinated because he was doing nothing. That narrative that black men have done nothing to fight back against systemic oppression, not only against ourselves, but against our women, our children, our elders, and our community is absolutely ridiculous. The cemetery is filled with black men, names we know and names we don't know, who gave their life for the freedom, liberation, and emancipation of African people. How can you disrespect the history of so many black men past and present who continue to fight? I'm sitting in a school right now that we built with all black money, four buildings that we're gonna educate black men and it's not easy to solve our problems because there's always black people in your very same community who's fighting against what you're trying to do to help it. But in addition to that, the white power structure is always waving its wand of oppression to try to sabotage anything we do. I think that the analysis of our women is too overly simplistic and in being such, it is dishonest. Hope, but you, uh, but you, hope, you they, hope they've done so good. much, you've only listed names and not accomplishments though. I can list some point. accomplishments. Okay, when it comes down to it, what have black men done since the 60s? We've turned around and we've gotten 
we, we, we're still inventing things. We still open up businesses. Here in L.A., you got black businesses all around town. So when black men do build things and we build things on an individual basis, you're not going to see an NBC special about what the great black man built. When Irv Gotti, Sir Knight, and uh, J, Mark, J. Prince tried to put together a, a distribution, they all got charges the next week. So it's not like we don't build things. When we do build things, something always ends up seem to happening. And in spite of that, in spite of that, you've seen the most black business male ownership that's, that's gone up in the last 60 years since the coronavirus. We still doing it. I personally got three businesses. So I don't know what you're talking about. I, am, I employ young black men. I've helped thousands of black children here in South Central L.A. So all this black men ain't doing nothing. Where are you kicking it at? So how are you? So how are you? Let me get hold on. 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 Hold for equality in America. How do you feel about those men that he listed, Hope? Have they done anything for the black community or not? Most definitely, I would be ignorant to say that they haven't, right? But I think that what we're failing to realize is that when we have this conversation about what black men have done, the consequences are usually because of white supremacy and the, the gaze of white folks on us are that the black men are then taking away and the black women have to then sustain those things. Dr. Umar, you're right. I don't agree with a lot of the stuff that you said, but you're absolutely right. It's not about the idea of who's doing it better or trying to the pissing match of the oppression Olympus amongst black people, but it's really about working together. The problem is what I find in working together is that the black man wants to lead whether he's acquired the the, the, the the gumption and the knowledge to be able to do so appropriately and effectively or not. The thing about it is when you're working together, we are a team. You get to lead this portion because you're better at it. I get to lead that portion because I'm better at it. And then we come to a common ground for both of us to succeed. But a lot of the times when we're talking about these succession plans and we're making all of these advocacy movements in order to progress the black family, the black man says, listen to me or fail. Right. As if black women have nothing to contribute to that. And I think that that's where the problem is. That's where the discourse needs to happen is how do we work together so that black men understand that we are meant to work side by side and not with me following you with my head down and saying, yes, this is our master, because that is me being subservient to you in a way that I might not want to do, especially considering if you do not have the credentials, the know how, the wherewithal or the lived experiences to lead me in a way that I might be better suited to do in this point of our journey. And Dr. black Omar. Men well, first of all, I do not endorse any kind of a second class citizenship role for black women. I believe black women have as much to offer as do black men. So I'm not sure who the queen is referring to because I am not a misogynist and I do not support that type of narrative that said the black woman's position is only to have children and to prepare food. But at the same time, I think black women have to look at themselves because although white supremacy has been the greatest enemy of the progress of black men, you would also have to argue that black women have probably been the greatest accomplice to supporting the white power structure in their destruction of black males, i.e. the conversation we're having right now where two intelligent black women have yet to indict white supremacy for the role that they play in the destabilization of the lives of black men. Is white supremacy responsible for any of the black man's plight at all? Absolutely, it exists. And black men have worked in tandem with white supremacy since they've become in contact with it. And this is why I say in the black community, we have very disingenuous, very dishonest discussions, especially when it when it's regarding black men, because we do have a black male worshiping culture. So what we do within that culture and Umar Johnson is showing it today is absolve black men from any accountability for what they've done. Number one, we wouldn't be in a system of white supremacy had it not been for black men. So if you want to go all the way back to history, then let's go back to history when black men were selling their own people into white supremacy. Let's go back into history when 16 years off the plantation, black men weren't worried about a, a war being waged on them. They were worried about getting access to, to white women. That's what you were wor worried about. And it's interesting there's a reason why I feel like Umar focused mostly on me and Hope's attitudes, and it's because he can't accurately answer the question. He mentioned names, not accomplishments. And the reason being is because- well, I think Umar he mentioned those names specifically because those, the, the accomplishments of those people don't have to be explained. 
Right, but those accomplishments are also accomplishments that I've heard Umar Johnson speak negatively about, specifically the civil rights movement and how damaging it was to Black people. But now he wants to sit here and say the very people who accomplished that were accomplishing something beneficial when, in his own opinion, that wasn't beneficial and did more harm to the community than good. So I think that because we're having such a dishonest discussion where Black men don't know, don't want to take accountability for what they've done, they want to be the victims of society, but then they want submission from the women. The bottom line is I'm not willing to deflect from the fact that, number one, Black men are the greatest non-white contributors to white supremacy. Let's just be real. White supremacy couldn't even exist without Black men's compliance. They're always uplifting whiteness, biracial children, and trying to assimilate. And that's why I went back to the notion of the only time Black men truly feel like there's a war against them is when they feel like they're they're being punished for something white men do. At the end of the day, y'all drop the ball. You're blaming white supremacy on your failures. We already know there's oppression, but Black women are double oppressed. We have more barriers to face. You have male privilege in a patriarchal system, and you can't even get it right. Well, I, uh, Dr. Umar, I think, Dr. Umar, Dr. Umar, I think we all know your stance on interracial marriages. Absolutely. So, but let me also so, so please this. acknowledge what the, the rest of what uh, Cynthia G has said. Absolutely. I'm not sure where Sister Cynthia took history class, but if you know anything <laughs> about the transatlantic slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade was a European enterprise. It was I'm not talking about the Sub-Saharan. I'm talking about the Sub-Saharan slave me, trade. You should go look me, into it. Excuse me. Excuse well, me. You you address me. May Omar, I finish? Go look into May the Sub-Saharan slave trade where black May men are trading their women and children for alcohol and tobacco. I do not want a monologue. May I finish? May I go ahead, Dr. Omar. The transatlantic slave trade was a European enterprise. It was not an African enterprise, although there were some chiefs who participated in it. By no means did they control the direction and extension of the transatlantic slave trade. So that's number one. Number two, black men resisted enslavement, not only on the shores of Africa, but right here in America. We celebrate Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser. There's literally hundreds of documented attempts by African men to liberate not only themselves, but their women and their children. So to act like we just sat there and were complicit in our own oppression is absolutely ridiculous. The other point I want to clarify for your information, Cynthia. G, you've never ever heard me condemn the civil rights movement. The good Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a hero of mine. And despite me being a pan-African nationalist, I take issue with other black nationalists who do want to dismiss Dr. King's accomplishment. The civil rights movement was necessary because it removed a psychological scar that suggested of racial inferiority. So you've never heard me deride the civil rights movement. I support it, although I took certain issues with it. The bottom line is when black women, black girls, black boys listen to this conversation we're having today, they're going to be confused because they hear two brothers speaking of a greater context to the problems that affect black men. And you hear two black women who want to keep scapegoating black men while ignoring the historical and contemporary systemic challenges that are constantly placed in our way. I'm going to say this and be quiet, Sister Tammy. I got to give you this. There was a recent piece of research, Tammy, that came out. And the research said a black man with a master's degree, they did a study. They had white males who had come out of prison apply for jobs. They had black men with master's degrees, Sister Tammy, apply for the jobs. And guess what? The white males with prison history and no education were called back more than 75% of the time than black men with no prison history and a master's degree. I'm aware of that. I, I, I am aware of that, of, of that survey. I am. Uh, Hope, uh, I saw you give Dr. Umar the side eye. It's only because <laughs> I can't, you have a thousand and one clips on the internet, but I know for a fact that one of the things that I was offended about in, in doing research or just seeing you on the internet is that you have definitely uh, talked about your disdain for some of the practices of Dr. Martin Luther King. So to sit here and gaslight us as if most of us have not That's seen That's not true. Find the clip. Uh, Find, no, no Find I mean, the clip. Uh, well, Find Dr. Omar, you yourself Find said you clip. had you you yourself yeah. just just seconds ago said you did find some things in the civil some, rights some movement things, problematic. But I supported the movement, and I still support it. 
Dr. King was not a Pan-Africanist, but one of my greatest heroes. Dr. King knew it was Garveyism to get back. He was moving in that direction. He said, Malcolm is gone. Garvey is gone. I got to hold it down. I got to hold it down. And he held it down, brothers and sisters. That's why whenever I go to Atlanta, I got to pay homage to the king. 39 years old. At 32, he was the unquestioned leader of black America at 32 years old. You can't say nothing to me about no Dr. King. I visit oh, Dr. King supported. every time I'm in Atlanta. Uh, I Nobody, I, 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 I have never been as dismissive a black man, of no, a, as a black person in If America, we're going to have the conversation, let uh, us be honest. Let's let, not I mean, let us, you're the only one not being honest, you are. You're, you're, you're not being honest. honest. If we find, the, find the clip. We don't have to argue the about it. We don't have to argue about it. You just admitted to it. We don't need it. There's six seconds left on the seconds left on this segment. We won't be able to find the clip on this show. Find the clip. But hope, uh, finish hope. Essentially, whether we find the clip or not, we know that those things have been said, and you know that you've said controversial things. Once again, we see you moving the goalposts when you find that. Controversial that according to who? We find, once again, because my thing is you and Cynthia can have that dynamic, but I give you the space to speak. I've given everybody that space to speak, so please don't interrupt me. At the end of the day, I You think interrupted me as well. Let's be fair. I, I did not. Yes, you did. And so once again, here we go in a space where black women are making a point. It's more important to the it's black It's not about you being a woman. It was about you being incorrect. When it has black nothing to do with you being a woman. I respect it's you. You were incorrect. You were incorrect. I, was, no. I didn't have the issue and with a woman. You were incorrect. Well, let's all let's all breathe in, breathe out, and I'll right. take a it's commercial not about her break. Being a woman. Right? She said we'll, something. Right. That was we'll untrue. take a commercial break. He's not in right that. To wrap this up on the business of being and black, they hate black, black men. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. One of the problems with the conversation, not with you, Tammy, but the responses. They're so individualized. Nothing is being evaluated from a group perspective or a community perspective, or a systems per perspective, or an institutional perspective. The bottom line is anything Black men want to do to liberate ourselves or our community, we can't do it without our women. And anything our women want to do to liberate themselves or the community, they can't do it without the men. It is not a competition. It should be a collaboration. But once again, some of us in the conversation are so filled with hatred for the opposite gender that we can never get around to talking about solutions. And in speaking of clips, Sister Tammy, there is one clip you might want to ask Sister Cynthia about because it was sent to me by about 30 people several months ago, maybe even weeks, where she suggested that women, black women, should abort their black male fetuses because after birth, they would not contribute to anything worthwhile in the black community. Could you ask her to clarify her comments? I would love to. Women, well, I would women, love to, too, but to we abort. don't have time. So, Dr.